Mia Araujo is an award-winning Latinx artist born and raised in Los Angeles. She strongly believes in the power of nature to heal us and to richly transform our increasingly disconnected modern lives. Mia is currently developing her passion project, an illustrated novel inspired by Alice in Wonderland. Join us today for a conversation about her career and her beginnings. All right, welcome everyone. Uh, we're here today with our co-host Mia Araujo, and uh, we're going to just sit down and do a, a in-depth roundtable discussion just about her, her life, her, her work, and what has brought her to this point in her, her career as an artist, as an illustrator. Um, so, so Mia, uh, let's just let's dive right in. Let's talk about art school. Um, where did you go? Where did you go to school? What did you, I mean, I'm guessing you studied illustration, but I mean, you could be fine art. I don't know. Um, how, where did you get your start? Yeah, I, I did study illustration. Um, I went to Otis College of Art and Design. It's in LA. Um, I actually wanted to go to Art Center uh, when I was 14. Art Center had a, like a summer program for high school kids where they taught classes and stuff. And um, I, I actually wanted to talk about that a little bit because it had such a huge like influence on the rest of my life as, a, as an artist. Um, my, I took my first figure drawing class at Art Center when I was 14. Um, mm -hmm. And again, you didn't have to have, submit a portfolio or anything. It was just a class. And I was, but I just felt so lucky to like, to be on that campus and to, to meet real artists and stuff. And my teacher was this amazing, like uh, he was a DreamWorks uh, artist named Donovan Howard. I'll never forget him. Uh, he, he was the first person I ever saw drawing from a model and like doing the gesture drawing and all the structural anatomy and everything. And uh, I didn't have any formal art training before then. So this was like my first experience of ever seeing anybody draw like that. And um, I think it just sparked like a lifelong passion for life drawing and figure drawing. And um, I mean, I guess to back up a little bit, I like Glenn Keane was my hero, like watching Disney movies and stuff. Like so many people probably remember in the 90s, they had those um, like behind the scenes, uh, like, you know, sort of features behind every Disney movie that was about to come out. And you'd see Glenn Keane drawing, you know, the character. And, and, uh, and that was the first time really seeing somebody doing that kind of gestural, uh, like figure stuff and really expressive characters. And um, I, I was like a lot of kids in that era that wanted to be a 2D animator. But by the time I got to college, 2D animation was pretty much gone. So um, like Lauren actually. So um, yeah. it was it was kind of a blow to be like, oh my gosh, I can't go into the, get into this. But actually I think by that time too, I had realized that animation was like, hand-drawn animation anyway, was doing a lot of drawings for a few seconds of, you know, of, of animation and stuff. Um, and I realized that I really loved the kind of stuff that Glenn Keane did or that Donovan Howard was doing, like the figure stuff. And I just wanted to be like, to learn draftsmanship and to really draw and paint really well. So I, I do remember at orientation or like when we were sitting down with the, like the people at Otis, just like saying, which department do you want to go into? And I was like, I want to go into fine art painting so I can learn to paint. And the counselor was, or whoever that, you know, the lady there was like, oh no, if you want to learn to paint, you should probably go into illustration because they won't teach you how to paint in the painting major in fine art. And so I was like, okay, I guess I'll be an illustrator then. <laughs> <laughs> That's so that's like, probably like a life saving <laughs> advice that you got there. Yep. <laughs> and, and I mean, that's not to say that none of the painting majors uh, actually learned to paint. I actually did meet a lady. She was like, I think in her 70s that did take the painting major and she she pushed through and painted beautiful figurative, you know, portraits and stuff because that's what she wanted. But like all her teachers hated her. And uh, so, and, and she didn't care. She like did not give a crap. She was like in her 70s, she's like, I'm painting, you know, when I want to paint, she was the best. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I want to live It's like, yeah. whatever, okay, yeah. <laughs> right. I'm going to do what I want. <laughs> so the, so I just, I was just thinking back because uh, you, you had to have gone to school between somewhere around when Shrek came out. So 2003. 2003 was when I started school, yeah. And okay. in 2007. So um, my sister and I actually graduated from college, uh, from college, from, from high school a year early because like the way our high school is really weird. They let you take college classes while you were in high school. So we just took our three senior classes in junior year and just got the heck out of there. 
And so I was like, I was even more naive than, <laughs> than every other college student freshman because I was a year younger than everyone there. So, um, and yeah, it was, I was still living with my parents. Both of my sister and I were, we would drive like an hour every day to go to school. Um, just got my license, you know? So it was definitely like little tiny Mia going out into the world for the first time and being a complete idiot and being real. it was, school was scary. Like it, hearing your, your stories, Eric, about like putting your art up on the wall and like your art is like your idea. It's what you think, right? Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it should be an expression of yourself. And uh, the, when I realized that that's what we were doing, we were putting up ourselves on the wall for the entire class to see. And then for the entire class to watch the teacher crit your art and crit your, your ideas uh, I, I actually got really scared by all that and just really stylized my work to sort of mask what I really wanted to do because it was like a self-preservation sort of tactic. So I, I honestly feel like I, I really studied all the stuff that I really wanted to learn after graduating from college because for me, college was just about like surviving and just getting through it, you know, uh, emotionally. Because yeah. <laughs> Hold on. So you, you saying you, you stylized your work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to know more about that. Like, what? Did yeah, that because mean? it doesn't. I don't. I don't understand. So, like, what? What would have been the difference in the critique had you just shown the stuff that you wanted, had the way you wanted to approach the art? So well, yeah, like, I, what were you making? Yeah, I was. My work was just really like overly quirky and eccentric and stuff. I was really fascinated by sort of eccentric characters and stuff. But I that wasn't me. I was trying to. I was almost like putting up a front. So like, even the subject matter that I was choose that I would choose was very like. I wasn't telling any honest stories, you know, it's like there were definitely things I was interested in, like I'd graphi gravitate towards a certain subject matter maybe that was interested in. The stylizing part of it was that when I went into school, I wanted to do like realism. I wanted to learn anatomy. I wanted to learn, you know, gesture, all that kind of stuff. But I started really uh, like stylizing my work almost as a way to not um, measure up against other people. Like that was my first time being around so many artists. Like my sister and I were the only people who drew in our class, like all the way up to college. And this was my first time being around like a thousand other artists, all of them who were better than me, you know? And it was, it was just as a perfectionist, as somebody who was like, you know, could not bear being terrible at the thing that I loved. It was almost like, I can't, I can't try for these things that all these people are way better at than me. So I'm going to stylize my work and just it was like that excuse that people make is like it's my style right it's like i don't have to learn the actual anatomy of the, of so the in a room full of realist portrait painters you decided to draw like for example you decided to draw cartoons that stand out from that pack yeah and, and just like really push the gesture and like break it and stuff but not in ways that were informed by actual knowledge it was just like oh but that's part of my style or the eyes are really huge like the, the eyes would like take up this much of the face you know and it's Was like it? it wouldn't huh was it like anime or was it like car just cartoon or like what influence was there from the, I guess, from the uh, illusory Mia art? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely a lot of the Disney influence because I did yeah. work on the Disney animation. So I did love it. And, you know, their characters did have larger eyes. But I mean, you know, the stylization of those films, again, is based on some kind of knowledge of realism of, of, of sort of a naturalistic type of, um, I guess, portrayal of like, you know, they're observing models and stuff and then stylizing. Mm -hmm. From that i was not observing models i was just you know um creating a style and that's and that's something too it was everybody was everybody at school was trying to find their style and be as unique as possible and be able to stand out and um and i just don't think i was doing it from an authentic place of like wanting to express myself i was more scared that people would see the real me and find that there wasn't anything interesting there so i was trying to create something interesting that um that wasn't authentic and wow. after I took graduating from school, and not that I didn't learn anything, it's just that it just felt like I got in my own way a lot. And, mm -hmm. and that's one of my biggest regrets because school is so expensive and I worked my ass off. Like I was valedictorian of my class and I was best oh, wow. in show in senior year. And, and it's like, I, I feel like I, even though I have those achievements, I'm like, I did not earn those things. I was not the best artist in my class. Like there were other painters that were better than me. There were other, you know, so it's like, it just mystifies me how I got that aside from just working hard and like, um, but again, I worked hard because I lived with my parents and I, I didn't have to, you know, all these kids were living on their own for the first time. They were 18, you know, living with roommates, all this stuff. I was living with my parents and just, and yeah, I would work 14 hours a day on my homework, but it's like, of course, if you have that much time, you're going to work hard and, and you do work hard and you do care about the coursework, you're going to do well, you know? But, so it sounds to me like you spent four <laughs> years stuck in your own head. Yeah. 
and uh psyching myself out <laughs> yeah yeah got to be the valedictorian of your class and you still feel voting. like you didn't earn it right yeah yeah and, I mean, but that's oh, like wow. you know. <laughs> not you're just saying that your stuff wasn't the best in the class by your own opinion you know like it could have been uh, it could have been on par or better than a good chunk of the class but yeah in know. your eyes it wasn't so that's that's pretty heavy and you know we are our harshest critics i think but uh but i guess the point is that my takeaway from art school was when by the time i graduated i didn't feel like i was ready to be hired by anyone and certainly i was confused too about what i wanted so like all my teachers taught they were mostly editorial teachers who also you know or editorial illustrators who also had you know jobs in maybe other branches of illustration but that was a lot of the assignments were editorial based or uh you know like very old school um and then actually a few of those same illustrators had just started exhibiting their art in the sort of pop uh pop surrealism lowbrow art scene that was sort of you know uh, coming to a rise in LA and stuff. And there was a gallery named La Luz de Jesus in Hollywood that would do a group show every year where they let, they pretty much have almost like a jury show. They let people submit and then who they selected got to exhibit, but they would never exhibit anyone that was not on their roster. And I actually got one of my pieces in when I was in senior year and I was like super excited about that. And it was my first experience of going to a gallery and seeing everybody like everyone was so hip, you know, and they're hanging out. It was almost like an art party, you know, they're like drinking, there's all this cool art everywhere. And all the art too was so like, not what you think of gallery art. It's not like nose in the air kind of stuff. It was so, you know, raw and like there's emotion and there was like, you know, sex and drugs and all kinds of stuff, you know, like it was just, it was an eye-opening experience. And, and I was just seeing those teachers of mine actually making a career for themselves in that kind of world and, and making their own styles be something that people would collect, like they want their art. Um, that was really intoxicating. And um, my teachers are basically saying, no, don't pursue that. Like try to get a job, you know, like as an illustrator. And I did the thing where I send out all the postcards and nobody kind of wrote back. And I just like, well, in the meantime, I'll just paint over here and submit to galleries and stuff. And that sort of took off and none of this did. So I, I just went that way, you know? So when you got your start in the gallery world, what was that like? Like, what was the, what was the first, well, I guess, like, what was the first, like, big show that you had done? And, um, like, how many, like, have you done since? Because in my purview, I'm not as familiar with the gallery world, so I'm really interested in, in seeing how that runs and how that works. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, that that particular gallery, La Luce de Zeus, was considered one of the bigger ones at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, even being in a group show with them was a big deal. Um, but I... You know it's like it takes a while to you have to have a certain so basically a lot of these bigger galleries they expect to see your art in other group shows and see and they take they kind of keep track of how it sells before offering you a bigger show because mm -hmm. a two-person show or a solo show is them risking their rent for the month for your yeah. art and they have to see if there's even a market or if they're a lot of the same collectors from all these galleries since they're all so close together i mean there's probably like 50, 10 or 15 of these major galleries and a lot of people what the, a lot of these galleries would have the same uh the shows the same night so there'd be gallery hopping from all the same collectors and stuff and there were even forums at the time too where the collectors would all talk about the new you know releasing artists and stuff or the new artists that were coming out on the scene because everyone's always trying to buy early before the prices go up and that sort of thing um but yeah in terms of getting into those shows uh i actually just um submitted my stuff to a gallery in downtown uh la called um the hive gallery which mm -hmm. would start out a lot of uh, new artists and stuff. And their price point was a lot lower. I think they, there, it was like a thousand dollars is the most you could sell a painting for. Whereas the oh, bigger wow. ones, it was like tens of thousands, you know, and that sort of thing. But um, so uh, I remember having my first solo sh show there and selling every piece there. And then from there, like getting the attention of the bigger galleries and that sort of thing. And then same with Cannibal Flower. That was the other one. Elsie Krosky actually as a really big name in that gallery world where he actually uh, did a portfolio review for me and a friend from art school where he looked at my art and he was kind of like telling me almost like this kind of piece would sell in our gallery and that sort of thing. Um, and he kind of gave me a, a spot as well and I did well on that one. So it was like Cannibal Flower and The Hive. I had like two sort of back-to-back -back little mini solos and since those did well then I got to sort of you know, show in, in, in group shows at the bigger galleries like Rock LaRue in uh, Washington and then Copro in Santa Monica 
and then Corey Helford um, in LA as well. So yeah, I don't know. If Have I'm you shown it. to um, any of the ones in New York City, Last Rites Gallery or or uh, Haven or any mm -hmm. of those? Definitely Last Rites and Haven. They're both great. And um, and I think actually, um, if I remember correctly, there was a gallery in LA that did a pop-up show in New York and we actually flew out with them for that. It was a three-day show uh, oh, wow. with some of their artists and Joao Ruas was one of the artists and I got to meet him and he's just oh, wow. such an amazing artist. Like it was, it was a really cool experience. But um, yeah, that whole gallery part of my career, there was just, it just didn't feel real to me. It just felt like at the whole time I felt like uh, like I wasn't treating it like a career in the sense that I just felt lucky that people were buying my paintings. I'm like, I'll keep doing this as long as people buy my paintings, but it was not planned, you know, in any way. And, and it, at least on my part, I just, I just wanted to paint and I felt very lucky that it was going on, but, um, but yeah, it's just definitely, there's the artists that have stayed, had longevity in that were definitely better at, uh, you know, planning out their shows and stuff. Like there are certain months that your art sells better during oh, and stuff like that. Yeah, there are all there are all kinds of things like that in terms of of sort of making chess moves almost with your with the way you laid out your shows and your schedule and stuff to not oversaturate the market and things like that. But, I love how I love how even after you had sold out of shows and after you had exhibited at all these different galleries that you still didn't like take it completely seriously or or think of it as like a thing that you could just continue to do. That's something that was real. Um, it seems like a constant theme throughout, um, you know, kind of, <laughs> you know, from college or just like kind of like not having, uh, you know, that kind of like, um, I, won't, I won't say faith, but not having that, that outlook of just like, oh yeah, like my art is good enough for me to be able to continue to do this. It's good enough to be able to stand on its own two feet. You just seem like you're kind of working like towards something, but it sounds like you weren't really sure about what it was. I always felt like the ugly duckling, if that makes sense, like in my class or in, you know, like in my gallery career. And it's, it wasn't like unwarranted. Like I remember when, when I was in these gallery shows, like the group shows and stuff, I would look at the sites that would post about the shows and they take photos of all the art that was there. And my piece was never in the photos. So I was like, oh, oh I guess, I guess it wasn't good enough, you know? And it was, they weren't doing it to be mean. They were taking pictures of the best art. And there were some amazing artists out there. I mean, big name artists like Audrey Kawasaki and like Amy Soul and like all these big name artists. And so, um, so it obviously my piece wasn't gonna be up there. I was a newbie, you know, but I took that to say my work's not good enough. So every time I would just try to level up with the next one. Um, and so, yeah, I just felt like, and I remember too, that was around the time I first started posting my art on social media and it felt like posting your art into the void and like no one responds, you know? Yeah, and uh, and it's just like you you put so much work. Like I would spend hundreds of hours painting these things traditionally and like rendering them. And and gosh, you should see the amount of detail I put in these paintings. It was like no composition. It was just like detail everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Only detail. <laughs> yeah, I would just like kill myself with every one of these paintings and put it out there. And it was just like no one gave a shit, you know. So I I honestly felt like if it was awesome, people would all be saying that it's great. But it's like what I didn't get at the time that it's it's what Eric said in his episode that it's like it's it's an it's a house in the middle of nowhere. It doesn't mean it's shit. It just means that nobody's seeing it. Yeah. Um, and I didn't understand that at the time. But I guess it was a good thing because it drove me to push myself and to and to be better. But um, but yeah, my very last sol solo show that I did, I think was like the best work I had done at the time. I actually hired models for the first time and had really like referenced everything, and it felt like a real level up for me. And yet that was around the time where like the, you know, the market was shrinking, people weren't buying as much art anymore and mm -hmm. actually sold about half of the pieces in my first big show at a big gallery like that. Mm -hmm. um, and it was still a really proud moment to have all my art, you know, just taking up that gallery and all my friends seeing it and seeing it all framed. Like it, it's still like one of my favorite memories of my art career, but it was bittersweet because I, I got into $20,000 of debt because I was living off my credit cards for the year that it was painting that show expecting oh. to be paid you know yeah um, and that and that's the other thing that they never talk about in in the gallery world is that solo shows awesome but definitely have to be prepared financially for it because you're basically working for free for an entire year and hoping to get paid in the end and you're giving 50 percent of your sales to the gallery who pretty much will you know mostly just expect to sell things on opening night and 
you know, the better, the better galleries will keep, you know, will hopefully have a relationship with you and promote your work and know how to sell your work. Um, but it's, it's really hard to find a gallery that, you know, that really gets you on that level. And uh, yeah, that's, that was uh, the, uh, the beginning of a very, <laughs> a very uh, different stage in my career, I guess. Yeah, that was what the, the appeal of um, gallery work I, I, I didn't care for was the, the idea that you're not being commissioned to do this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, you, somebody is saying, hey, we love your work. Put together, and if you want to put together a, a solo show uh, in a year, so you, you spend a year knocking out maybe 12, 10, 12 solid samples or solid pieces for this show and three could sell mm -hmm. like you could spend your whole year mm -hmm. and then the gallery is going to take half yep. of those three paintings for working with you pretty much for a month <laughs> yeah. out of the entire year and that's the thing too the bigger the gallery space is your work is going to look horrible if it's like a bunch of small pieces so you have to paint big so yeah. i painted a six by four foot painting and it was Ooh biggest painting I've ever done and as it took me for like six weeks I think uh I painted actually pretty fast for how big it was because actually sometimes I take six weeks to do a much smaller piece now um than that but um and it had so much detail I was like this is the showstopper of my my show it's definitely gonna sell but who's you know who's gonna dedicate that huge wall space to something that they're not you know they have to be completely passionate about that subject matter about you as an artist and the whole gallery world too is about investing in art too that they expect will sell later for a bigger you know for a higher price and so there's definitely artists with resale value who can sell their bigger pieces much more easily so yeah it's it's definitely a lot um it's a lot that you learn through mistakes you know and the mistakes mean negative you know money that you're not making in time that you've already invested and yeah those paintings could sell later but that painting's in my parents living room actually so <laughs> 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 so it sounds like so the gallery the gallery world is was treating you good to an extent I think so, yeah. and you didn't feel that you were where you wanted to be to go out and seek out professional illustration work at that time so like where because I know you work in you worked or work in the service industry so like how did how did you transition into that um, and what made you decide on service industry and not I don't know like some office clerical job or something like that like yeah so uh, uh around the time <laughs> that actually the year of that my solo show I went to the IMC and they you know they do like portfolio reviews and stuff and uh one of the art directors looking at my work was just like no one would ever pretty much saying no one would ever put this on a cover or hire you for this like it's like it was my work was just too niche or was just too me or whatever too gallery whatever that meant it just was not commercial and I was again that was that work that I was really proud of that I had leveled up on and I was like this is the best I can do and I guess I'm just not hireable um, and so I, you know, th around that time with the debt, um, there was definitely some, some big life changes I actually moved out for the first time. I'm definitely a late bloomer. I was 26 years old. I was moving out. Um, and I was in debt and all this stuff going on. It definitely affected my work. And, um, and I basically was not the person I was when I was making all that gallery work. When I was making that gallery work, I was living with my parents and I was pretty much like still a kid. I was in my own world. I didn't have to deal with any other people. Um, my, my best friend was my twin sister, you know, like I didn't really have to reach out to other people. So I was definitely a very ins insulated person. And, um, and I, I would work 14 hours a day on my paintings and stuff. I actually got carpal tunnel while working on that last show. Oh, so wow. all of that stuff sort of culminated to, uh, that year, just being like really confused about where I was going to go next because um, I still wanted to work in galleries and stuff. I was doing group shows, but, but I was just, at that time, I, was just, I just don't want to invest in another big show. And I honestly didn't know who would take me for a big show anyway, since that last one didn't sell all the way out. Um, so I, I honestly didn't think after that sort of art, art director feedback that um, my work would be commercial. So I actually didn't try to submit my art to any like illustrator, art directors, or anything like that. Uh, but I did like look around for different art jobs like on Craigslist and things like that. And I, I applied to like 
hundreds of jobs, I feel like, and just did not get any callbacks. And finally, I was just like at the point where I was even applying to be people's administrative assistant. You know, I was writing my, my resume, trying to show the last eight years of working as an artist, as a, as a self-employed artist as saying, I've run a business, you know, and I've done this and that. And it's just like, uh, I, I don't know, I was just not really good at, at, at bullshitting my, my resume or whatever it is, but I just, one thing led to another. I just said, I, I need to make money. And so I just uh, went into the little grocery store down the street that sold produce and just, and applied. And the guy even, the, the boss even said like, why do you want to work here? Like, he's like looking at my art resume and saying like, you've been working at galleries and, or, you know, exhibiting your art around the world. Why do you want to work here? And I was like, please just give me this job. I just need money. <laughs> and it was like $8 an hour. And I feel like the decision why, like I chose that was because I was burnt out. I had carpal tunnel. I didn't know where my art was going to go in terms of um, commercial or fine art. And I just kind of like needed some space, you know, uh, to, to just figure out what I was going to do. And um, yeah, it was just maybe not the smartest decision, but it was a decision <laughs> and I just went with it. And um, I, I worked there for about a year and then took on, I, I started working at In-N-Out Burger. So uh, they paid like two more dollars above <laughs> minimum wage. So, uh, so I went to work there. And, uh, and then after I quit the, the grocery store job and started nannying for my best friend for like six months. So for like two years, I had two jobs. I was working 60 hours a week, not getting paid very much, but I was getting paid and I was slowly chipping away at my debt and on the side, just trying to work on my skills. And I was just like, you know what, all this time, I'm not going to get anywhere with my career. But yeah, I just started like really like honing in on my craft and that kind of thing. Um, I just, what question, I, I keep going back to what you said about the uh, IMC. So for people that don't know what that is, it's an oh, yeah, illustration yeah. masterclass yeah. where for a week, you uh, students are at a, a college mm -hmm. and being surrounded by all these professional illustrators that are going to lecture them and uh, give them this crash course and how to compose and create illustrations mm -hmm. uh, that are marketable or so that they can go out and do the kind of work that they want to do. Yeah. Um, but you had a professional art director. Was this an art director or was this an illustrator telling you that nobody would put this, they're like, this isn't good I mean, enough for cover art? It was an art director, but I mean, they had guest art directors they would bring in to look at people's portfolio. Like you'd sign up for portfolio reviews during the week. Cause the whole point is like, you're trying to finish a painting. And honestly, like my painting, I went to IMC two years in a row and I didn't finish the painting in either year. So I was even in doubt that I could even do this, you know? Um, but it's just like, maybe it was just not the best time in my life to go there because I wasn't pursuing illustration. I, I actually went there to learn from the teachers. I was like, Greg Manchus, Ian McKaig, Barong, oh, yeah. like, hell, heck yeah, I want to learn to paint from these guys. But I think I made the mistake of thinking, hey, my art has sold in galleries. Let me show this art director. Maybe they can give me some work. And what I didn't understand at that time, it's like, your art might sell in this other market over here, but that doesn't mean that this market over here is going to hire you or, or they can find any use for you. And I think, I don't think he was trying to tell me like your art sucks or your art would never be. He was just saying like, for my purposes, I could not use this. And he was right, right. you know, it yeah. just wasn't, there was no shape design in my work. There was no like composition that was like really clear and solid. There was a lot of detail yeah. everywhere. And that would just not make great illustration for, you know, most of the stuff we see in the spectrum and stuff. But also, I just want to, because if, if, if somebody is listening to this or watching this and they're thinking, man, I really like lowbrow pop surrealistic art. My whole portfolio is that. And my, also my, my goal is to one day do something for the great tour books or, or something like that. Just know that tastes change. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Art directors change. Mm -hmm. Um, what's popular changes. Um, God. I do have to say about lowbrow though, at the time that I started, you actually didn't have to be really good at draftsmanship or at composition or any of that mm -hmm. stuff to actually do really well. If you came up with a really great like concept and you yeah. could just do a, a million paintings based on that variations of the theme, you were gold. In fact, the problem I had was that I was too interested in too many different things. So my stuff, if you zoomed out, you can see a theme, but it was not as obvious as some of these artists that had a, like a style that was like a signature for them, you know? Um, but yeah, I feel like there, there was an element of that too, where I delayed a lot of my, uh, of my learning after college in terms of anatomy and composition, all these 
foundational skills I feel like I didn't really learn in college um, till later because I didn't need them to exhibit in galleries. Um, it was not, but now if you try to exhibit in galleries now, it's definitely different. Like the stuff mm -hmm. that is more, more based in realism or at least has some knowledge in terms of foundational skills does better. And so yeah. you're very, definitely right in terms of styles changing and taste changing. Yeah, when did you figure out, um, you know, it was it was the point, like, I know after you got, got out of college and everything, you said before that you felt like your art had this kind of like mask that you were hiding behind, like something mm -hmm. that you weren't really being authentic. When did you start actually getting your authentic voice back into your art? Was it during the gallery, um, you know, the gallery work or was it like afterwards? And what was that process like? Like, how did you go about actually like discovering what you what you wanted to say? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Cause um, I think the first wake up call in terms of that was um, that um, that guy I told you about, LC Krosky that was looking at our portfolios uh, before I, I started showing in galleries. He, he flipped to a piece of mine that I kind of done experimentally in this kind of um, stylized thing that definitely wasn't me. And he looked at me and he's like, no, that's not you. And I was like, you don't even know me, but he could tell from that piece that it was not authentic. And I was struck oh. by that, like by someone telling me that to my face. And that actually, and he was basically telling me with that, you need to do stuff that's you and like people will be able to tell, um, not in so many words, I think I'm butchering what he said, but, but I took his meaning, you know? And I felt like I really need to lean into this thing that I'm trying to hide instead. And, and that's the, the way people will connect with me. And that, you know, like th that person I was before then was, couldn't be any di more different than who I am now in terms of, to me, if, if, if I can't create a piece that I don't see something that I uh, attach to in it, I just don't even want to do it. And it's like, not out of a sense of entitlement, it's, it's just in, in the sense that I just don't know how I could um, communicate with someone through that piece. Mm -hmm. um, and even if I'm doing it for a client, I have to have conviction in that. Otherwise, I feel like I'm doing them a disservice, you know? Um, but yeah, in terms of like, after he, I got that feedback from him, I... I think it was just a lot of just trying to understand what are the things I like and why do I like them and not just on a surface level, like what kinds of stories I want to tell. Um, so I honestly, like the, the women I would paint in my gallery world, uh, paintings were at least what I was trying to convey was this kind of uh, more like an emotional uh, strength as opposed to a physical strength because I was seeing a lot of female characters that were physically strong. And I couldn't relate to that not being very athletic or very tough myself, you know, but I, I felt like there's this other strength you know, and female characters that I just want to convey because I'm not seeing that. And um, I think a lot of that comes from uh, being a like an immigrant kid. I mean, at least that's, I, I feel kind of like I'm not of this culture or of that culture. There's something in between which with which my identity kind of, you know, centers itself. And so I've always been drawn to stories, uh, whether they're folk tales or fairy tales or whatever it is, like, um, that aren't really in the mainstream, you know, like th they actually interest me more if they're not in the mainstream because it's just, um, I connect with, I, I just like, I guess, I don't know how to put it into words, but um, but I think that that's been a theme through all my work from the gallery days till, till now is just, uh, if I'm not seeing it in the world, but I want to see it, then I will put it in my work um, to sort of, you know, um, give it life, I guess. Um, and uh, the sort of through line for my gallery work too was just like, I have this world in my mind's eye, like a fantasy world. And it's sort of like taking a snapshot in there um, and showing you sort of the world that I see. Um, so it was de definitely very, you know, whimsical and that kind of stuff. But but as I tried to zero in on what is that world, it was, it was uh, you know, more introspective. And so I, I began to, to journal a lot more, to write a lot more, at least just for me and try to discover what kind of art I wanted to make. Um, and then, like I said, really lean into that to the point that that's actually the only art I'm interested in making is something that I have a strong conviction for. So how did how did that that strong conviction that you wanting to paint the stuff that you want to see, how did that lead into your Alice in Wonderland? Yeah, I, I, um, actually, around this time, that all this stuff was going on uh, and trying to figure out the art that I wanted to make. I went back to. Um, just trying to go back to my to my roots or to earlier times of earlier art making and um i created a project that wasn't it wasn't a great story but it was a it was inspired by an african art class that i took in in my senior year of college and it was my first time seeing any like history from the african continent because none of my history classes ever that touched on world history ever even went to africa um mm. and it was i i still have my textbook from that class and it's like taped together because i would just like you know, take notes and highlight and everything and it just like flip through it so many times. But I just remember in that class being so blown away in terms of 
a fantasy fantasy world. I was just like, how are they not set here? Like in terms of the the cultures, the the visual imagery, the people, the clothing, the music. Uh, that was the, the first spark, and I didn't know what role that would play in my in my work. But um, but I think the thing that I was missing again was what? Why am I not seeing this more in the mainstream? Um, and so I did like a like a senior like project where I worked on a book or something. I did some illustrations based on some like sort of like African designs in this very loosely Alice in Wonderland kind of thing. It was just a girl going into an imaginary world. So in 2013, I kind of stumbled on this project again and said, you know what, I actually want to, to develop this more, but it just became a, a return to, to, my, to when I would write stories when I was younger and illustrate my own stories. I wanted to, to start with a story that I didn't have to write myself all the way. That was based on something that's already well known, the characters that people already know. Um, and gosh, this Alice project has gone through so many iterations from that first uh, that first version. But in, in terms of why setting it in an African world, I think it came from just really trying to understand fantasy, like why fantasy was always so West, like Western centric, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, and, and basically just not wanting to contribute more to that because the feeling kind of was that it's like, if I don't ever write a fantasy story that's set in a Celtic or a British, you know, medieval world, like everybody else has me covered pretty much, you know, like that, that will keep being made. But, um, but at the time I was not seeing something uh, with an all black cast with um, amazing like magical worlds and stuff set in Africa. And, and I just wanted to see, th see that myself and I just wanted to draw that. And so um, it started mostly as an illustration project, but then I got really interested in, in translating it into a sister story. Um, and uh, when I moved out, it was definitely a separation from my sister and it was a really painful time in our relationship. So this story actually has become, you know, Alice leaves uh, her her sister in order to pursue Wonderland. So it was kind of become almost a way to to sort of heal through that stuff in our relationship um, and to to understand stuff about myself and and to write to get back into writing and do something really personal, you know. That's amazing. Yeah, I think it's always the best stories too that come out of that absolutely like authentic experience of you're trying to to process something, you're trying to cope with something that's going on in your life. And I think that comes across a lot, just like in the presentation and how you depict your characters. Because earlier you were saying that, um, you know, you really want to show that emotional strength and that emotional intelligence through your characters and through the body language, the expressions, um, you know, just through how you present these characters, that all comes through. Even if they're not physically strong, you can see that strength and that presence. Um, so I just wanted to call that out as something that, you know, is absolutely working, I think in your work do you think do you feel like it's helped since like you know you've actually been able to write the story out do you think it's like actually helped you process the relationship with you and your sister and kind of moving away from her oh definitely yeah and it's it's you know like our relationship has evolved a lot since the last eight years excuse me the last eight years um but and it was really hard to write it actually the mo more emotional parts early on because i wasn't we weren't completely over some of those hurdles. So I would focus more on the characters themselves, like what's my version of the Mad Hatter? What's my version of the Queen of Hearts? And in terms of the world building stuff. So I, I it's, yeah, I worked more on the world building and the character designs and the look of the thing what, when I couldn't really process that stuff. And actually the last, I think my first stab at some of the really deeper stuff happened three years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and it still felt like I'm not getting this right. Uh, but yeah, it's a process, but it, it was really tough for sure. And I'm, I'm still perfecting that part of the story. Um, this year, actually, I've worked on the writing more than any of the art for the first time. And um, it's it's gone through so many changes. Like it used to be really to become something of my own. And each character has a completely different name, but they most like are stand-ins for those characters and stuff. Yeah. And it's been really exciting to see it morph into its own thing. Um, definitely has its roots in Alice. Like you can definitely see them all there. And then the, the emotional story feels like it works better. And then our relationship is also closer to weirdly enough during the pandemic, even though we can't physically see each other, I feel like we talk more and, and like hang out more and spend more time together now. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been a great way to, to heal through that process, but, um, but also to grow as a person and to, um, the interesting thing too is that Alice at first was supposed to be more modeled on me, but over time she actually became more my sister. And then, so it's like, she's kind of a little bit of both of us. So each sister has different elements of us both. Um, and I think that there's something kind of poetic and beautiful about that, actually, that I can relate to both characters in that way, you know? 
Well, that, I just think that's beautiful. That's really awesome. Um, yeah. I mean, it's it's true. It's you. It's from the heart. It's something you're passionate about. And it shows with every, with, you know, everything that you post around that. I think one of the pieces you, you had painted was for Everyday Original. Mm-hmm. I, I have it hanging on my wall right here. I was so happy to see that email. I'm like, oh my God, oh, you bought it? <laughs> I better believe it because I, I saw it on the site. I was like, <laughs> oh, done. Like, I've only done that <laughs> twice on that site. Oh I, my God. But I said, yep, I'm not, I have somebody else take that. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> that's a freaking honor it's oh, awesome <laughs> yep um but cool so yeah i want i want to know more i know we talked um a lot about writing last uh last time with armand but i'm really curious about your writing process and how you translated basically being purely like mainly a visual artist to being a writer and visual artist and blending those two things together what was that like for you uh yeah it was definitely really uh it was tough because uh, it, a little bit of what Armand said that it's it's tough to st- to like uh, focus so much on one craft and it's like I still don't even con- I don't consider myself in any level of mastery with painting at all but at least I feel like I, I can gauge where the results are going to be or I know about how long something's going to take and even if I'm unhappy with certain parts of a painting I can still live with it you know and and move on to the next piece and with writing it just felt like I'm just out. It was this was this personal story that it's like I I knew how the the, the story was going to end be, because it's what I you know that's the closure I wanted for this character, um, and so I feel like that's something he talked about a little bit in terms of helping you at least navigate some of it is knowing how you want this character to grow and seeing that uh, knowing that from early on I don't think that really has changed for my character I know exactly the kind of growth I want her to have because it's the it's the basis of that story every story starts with a flawed character a character that's maybe not ready for the world in this case you know um, has some things to learn and the the things that happen throughout the story hopefully change them or if they're a character that don't change um, you're showing how they're staunch in in themselves and they're standing up to all this like barrage of the story you know um, but in terms of like, I was just trying to do, you know, the free writing stuff that I used to do when I was a kid, I actually grew up reading a lot and writing and illustrating my own stories. And then just, and actually minored in creative writing in college, um, but had a horrible experience with a teacher there that, um, that actually turned me off to writing for 10 years. So it was like, mm-hmm. it was, and again, I think that was, that was actually part of when I was trying to be authentic to myself and it he yeah he was the worst possible teacher to, to share that with and it just made me want to close up and not share that with anybody um so it took about 10 years to come around through the guise of Alice in Wonderland like saying you actually don't have to tell anything about yourself you, you just have to interpret this really popular story uh to then becoming like the most personal story I could possibly tell <laughs> um but um but to have um I guess the courage to do something completely that you have no skills at really or that you haven't developed the skills at as long enough as as doing the art is really scary, but I think it's also exciting to apply to my art too. And um, for the longest time, something we, we actually didn't get into um, for all those years, like after school and stuff, and even struggling with my day jobs and stuff like that, there was something really humbling about that whole process of, of, of just being like, yeah, I actually don't have all the answers. Like, I love drawing faces and I love anatomy, but I actually don't know all of it. There's still a lot left to learn. There's a lot of gaps to my knowledge and embracing that and not being intimidated or, or you know, not being um, self-conscious about that or, or defensive about that or trying to hide my, you know, weaknesses. It was just, I, I feel like um, a part of, you know, being new at something like writing helped me be a lot more humble about the things I needed to learn with my art. Um, so they just kind of feed off of each other in a big way. Um, and the interesting thing too about writing and illustrating together in the same project in the way that I'm trying to do means that um, the writing is a little bit less um, like a traditional prose novel because some of the work is going to be done by the illustrations as well. Mm-hmm. So, and that that will come in the final pass with editing, but um, but yeah, learning not to edit yourself in those first drafts where you're just, you know, get purging it out of your head um, is actually really difficult because again, that perfectionist in you in this other field is trying to make it sound good, trying to make it, <laughs> trying to make it be the thing you can hand off to somebody and they'd be impressed by it in some way, or at least understand what you're trying to do. And, and yeah, you just have to shed all of that in order to, to learn how to do it properly. So, so are you, are you setting this up to be like a one page has the illustration, another page and then page, 
next to it has the text or the prose? Like, it, or is it going to be like chapters of, of, of text and then sporadic illustrations? Or, like, how are you setting? How are you setting? Because I've seen art books that are like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, I would love for it to be as illustrated as possible. I am a very, very slow traditional painter, so I don't know how possible that will be in the end result. But what I envision is for there to be like double page spread and just like full spread or full page illustrations that are in acrylic. And then a lot of spot illustrations done in my uh, like sort of watercolor, uh, like line drawing style that I also have. So it's like, it'll be like, I want art on every in every spread if there if it can be or at least every three spreads you know but it's like it's going to be a very heavily illustrated novel as opposed to your traditional you know plate illustration with you know chapter spots and stuff like that um but yeah originally I I, I looked at the fairies book by Brian Froud and Alan Lee and just like yes this is what I want like art on every page like three or four drawings and stuff and and you know that's I've never read that book actually it's like I just looked at the art and so it's yeah. a balance if you want people to read the book um actually Armand's is a great example in terms of the mm -hmm. layout um you can read it and then turn the page and then see the art they're almost like pauses in the uh in the experience the Alan the, hold on the the fairies book mm -hmm. has text in it yeah see <laughs> 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 not a novel, Eric, but <laughs> good of a job. Do you, you have it? Eric's gonna go get it. <laughs> this <laughs> book? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the fairies one, right? It has a different cover this than the one, one I remember. Come on be... now. I've had this. Book. I like that. You've had how long have you had this book, Eric? High school. <laughs> yeah, right. That's about as long as I've had it. <laughs> and you've never okay. known, known and had text in it. Never bothered. It was just a white wow. page. It was just a white page. I was like, I have like bookmarks. Yeah, just looking at all the, all the art is just so distractingly good. You're just like, I don't, I, I don't need to read it. <laughs> oh, I've definitely had this in high school because there's like sketches from oh, cool. stuff. Yeah, <laughs> man. That's why I was like, looked off to my shelf. Like, like I know I have this book. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I'm gonna have to pay attention to that stuff. All right, yeah. but. The um, a good job. <laughs> 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 I, a fr so a friend of mine that is also doing his own graphic novel um uh that's being published by harper collins i think next year he was telling me push your ego aside it does not have to all be 100 percent oil painted yeah acrylic painted traditional <laughs> painted blah 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 you know you can paint but he says nobody cares he's very blunt he just <laughs> says for the most part the people that are going to buy this book from you want a solid story and they yeah. just want beautiful art they don't right. care how you created it yeah exactly so that's the so, thing i actually like the the manuscript is the most important thing to me if if some i lose somebody by the first couple pages i like who cares you know to yeah. me it's just like that story has to grip you and and that's the thing too if the art the art's already going to be in competition with the writing it's going to be more interesting we want to look at pictures more than the writing so the writing already has a lot to to make up for because it's an illustrated book so yeah to me the the manuscript is the most important thing because that's the thing i have to prove especially in this day and age where we we just we we read tweets that are just like a few hundred characters or whatever you know it's like it, we, we read things in sound bites and stuff um sound by form instead of like our attention spans already so diminished and so yeah. um and that's the thing too i was like well an illustrated novel will encourage people to read more maybe that wouldn't be interested in reading because it's got a lot of art but actually might not they might just flip through the art and just put the book down you know that's a so, book. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> what i did <laughs> So, uh, but yeah, like uh, it's definitely challenging, but it's it's been great. I feel it felt like actually this whole month I've been doing NaNoWriMo. I just hit thirty five thousand words, even though this is airing way later. <laughs> when we're recording this, I hit thirty five thousand words, and it feels like I might actually make it. But it's like I, the numbers doesn't don't matter to me. It's the fact that I've been writing every day. I actually yeah. feel like so much closer to who I was when I was a little kid, just writing stories and not caring if it was good or not just because I enjoyed it and um I love the story so much where it's come like where was this year in January to where it is now 
it's just, and, and I didn't do it alone. I have a really good friend that's been helping, like we've been helping each other with our stories and I couldn't recommend that enough, especially as a beginning writer, to have mm. somebody who either has some kind of knowledge uh, on writing like more than you so that you can feed off of each other because even if they have more writing knowledge than you, they'll always need feedback on what works. Um, so the, I would definitely recommend that to, to beginning writers to team up with somebody who you can like trade manuscripts and give each other notes um, and like what works, what doesn't, and really do a lot of that in the outline stage. I actually re-outlined my story over the summer. I spent two months just in the outline stage to make sure that everything worked like story beat wise um, so that the story just feels like stronger and tighter instead of like this convoluted bloated thing it used to be. So, um, but yeah, it's a lot of work. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah, the, the process of writing and allowing yourself to be vulnerable enough to put everything down on paper without going back and editing everything that you want to edit or everything that you think might be wrong mm -hmm. is really, really difficult. Um, again, as somebody who is going through that as well. Um, mm -hmm. And to be able to actually just let go and let yourself do that is a really is a really big accomplishment. So Congratulations on getting so far in uh, Nano. That's amazing. <laughs> Honestly, 35,000 words is real impressive. I was supposed to have done it in the beginning and I, I fell off completely, but I have a bunch of other stuff going on too. You know. So for, <laughs> for, for, the, uh, for the noobs out there that don't know what Nano is. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Keep doing that. Oh, you're asking yeah. me? Yeah. yeah. No, but like, what what is it? I mean, I totally know, but I'm just, you know. It's National Novel Writing Month. It takes place every November, and it's the goal is to write 50,000 words by the end of the month. So with 30 days, it averages to around 1,760-something words a day. Mm -hmm. um, and that sounds manageable, but uh, like my, my friend Shreya and I are, are like texting back and forth on our progress and like checking each other's progress. And, and like if you miss a day, suddenly it's 3,000 words. And if you miss another day, suddenly it's like 5,000 words. And so you get behind so, so quickly. So it's like you have to have a system. So I, sh I should either start my day like right after working out or end my day right after painting with like a two hour session and just write as much as I can. Some days it's 500 words, some days it's 1500, some days it's 2000, you know? Um, but I, I do try to catch up. Um, there's days where I will just write the whole day, like on oh, I'll take a weekend day to do it um, mm -hmm. because I'm trying to get this thing done um, to submit and stuff to, to publishers and stuff. But um, but yeah, it's a, it takes a lot of doing, especially if it's not a habit that you have yet. It takes a lot of like forcing yourself to sit down in the chair and just put your hands on the keyboard and just, just do it. <laughs> have you thought about, or I don't know, are you a member of the, uh, how, what, what are the, what's the acronym? S-C-B-W-I? No, I'm not. Actually, I signed up for that right after graduating from college because I thought I wanted to be a children's book illustrator but I, I just paid the dues and read the, the things and just kind of never did anything with it. But um, I think again, cause uh, the stuff I was, I thought I wanted to be a children's book illustrator but my stuff was just so complicated. It was just too detailed for the kind of- I, Well, I, yeah. <laughs> depending on the publisher, they're looking at graphic novels now too. So- Oh really? Like- Yeah, it, I know this the- is, This the is your time. Thing. This this whole thing, is this is your time, yeah. The only thing um, is I'm not doing a graphic novel because those are sequ sequential, right? They're like comics, so that's- Well, that's... no, no, a, a, a graphic novel. I mean, if you look at, you look at, gra you look at, look at Dinotopia. It's a graphic yeah. novel, all right? Illust that whole yeah. thing, page cover to cover is illustrated, mm -hmm. right? There's text boxes. It's just yeah. a big, thick children's book. But, and then there's, there's others that are, you know, a page of text, a page of prose, page of mm -hmm. illustration, um, double page spreads, but a graphic novel is however you want to set it up. It just okay. has to be thicker than an average children's book. Okay. Um, and have a certain number of illustrations in the book mm -hmm. versus text. Right. And then it just automatically qualifies. It doesn't have to be a thick comic book with like panel for panel, like oh. comic book format. Um, but uh i know random house is looking for stuff like diverse authors diverse content that's like that's that's stop number one I mean, keep looking at my shelf because i had a book that had a bunch of addresses and stuff i don't remember where it is i'll have to find it later to yeah. give to you but um but yeah 
But they, oh, yeah. I know. Oh, oh no, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go. For anybody who doesn't know, the um, SCBWI is the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. So just letting this put yeah. that. <laughs> and so that that organization has branches across the United States. Yeah. Um, I was a member of the New York branch, oh. and they have, they. What's really cool is they have conferences, mm -hmm. uh, annual conferences. They they have one in on the East Coast that takes place in New York City at the uh, Grand Hyatt Hotel, um, which was so awesome because you get to see all of these heavyweights in the industry having, you know, like ballroom dinners and talking about. Caldecott award-winning blah 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 <laughs> presentations yeah it's like the and but there's also a ton of lectures about how to write for children's books how to how to illustrate for children's books who to talk to portfolio reviews um there's a whole section on, on that but um i think for the amount of time and effort that you're putting into this it would just make I don't know, to me, it just would make sense to aim it at a, uh, you know, a big publisher first and see, see if there's any takers, any, 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 any interest um, uh, before doing a Kickstarter. Yeah. I mean, I, I've, you know, the Kickstarter thing was my first option it was what i thought of uh when i was first doing this because i was like i want all creative control i want to lay it out the way i want to lay it out and do the th you know i don't want anyone to tell me what to do it was the idea but um the more i've seen over the years like friends mutual friends of ours with builder kickstarters it feels like a full-time job in and of itself and i've spent so much of my i've spent like 30 we 30 hours a week every day for like the last at least for the last six years on something that's not creating art and right now that just does not sound like something I'd, that I want to to do, you know, in terms yeah, of, right. I feel like I have so much time to make up for now um, yeah. in terms of like, I'm not serving anymore. Actually, like when COVID started, uh, they, they they opened, the restaurant I was working at opened back up for Memorial Day, which I felt was way too soon. Um, mm -hmm. So I just chose not to go back and had been living off of unemployment. And I, I luckily put my tax returns this morning into saving this morning, this year into savings. Uh, so that'll hopefully get me to the next year, but um, at least for a few months. Um, but yeah, I've been recently taking on some freelance as well, just to hopefully just get back into to doing art and, um, and try to make a shot out of it for real this time. So yeah I, I just i i i'm i'm all i support you 100 percent. i i just think that but we'll 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 talk after but i just i want to direct you toward whoever i can That's awesome. point you at because um they have whole teams mm -hmm. like these these publishers have whole teams dedicated marketing departments um yeah like agents and editors and everything. I've learned so much about all that from like all of it, all of it. And it's not just some editor that doesn't care. That's just looking for typos. Oh yeah. They, the, the editors are there for a reason because they understand story structure. They understand mm -hmm. all of that stuff and they can say, well, you know what, this whole passage here, you can just take that out because it's, you're just re repeating yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah. You'd be like, Oh, <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'm really curious about those. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, but at the end of the day, or they might just say, well, you could sum up this whole page or these, the, the, these pages in one page, you just yeah. condense this. Right. And then you have more space to add in additional illustrations if necessary or whatever. Yeah. Um, but I just think that's fantastic, a, a fantastic resource to have. And if they take their cut, they take their cut. I mean, you end up with a, if you end up with a, a stronger product that ends up on store shelves from here to Bangkok, why not? Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. And, uh, and honestly, like what you said too, about like the editing process does not end when you submit your manuscript to a publisher. Like I've learned about that too, like hearing all these stories. Oh. So for anyone that's considering going that route, I'm going to be trying to get this manuscript as perfect as possible, as solid as possible to submit it. But that's not the end. I have to be open to then changing it and not like, and people get scared and they think, oh, they just want to make it like uh, the next Twilight or whatever, but they're not, you know, it's, or they're just trying to, you know, change it for like sales reasons. But th that's, I think that's not entirely true. Like you're saying, there's people out there that actually care about your story. You just have to 
uh, you just have to find the right agents that will back you, that will understand your story, that's passionate about the story you want to tell, how you want to tell it, and they'll line you up with the people that will help you make that thing communicate the way you want it to. Yeah, <laughs> and, but the only thing that, because uh, my my agent is actually trying to help me uh, with this as well, and she was just saying that the one thing you have to be uh, open to is being flexible mm -hmm. with your story and with your art, because if you just come in and say, here's my thing, find somebody that'll print it. Yeah. And, you know, if they, they look at have an editor go through it and say, well, we have notes and you go, I'm not taking notes. It's dope. <laughs> As is just <laughs> find somebody to print it. They'll just yeah. go, okay. Pass. But <laughs> if it doesn't sell. That's on you. It's on you. Yeah. You know? We've done with this is our job. We know we've done the research. We exactly. know how to move this. Yeah. So, but no, that's cool. That's cool. Um, yeah. I was curious, uh, not to go off topic, if you want to put this uh, earlier, you can. But um, when you started to make art for the series, how did people respond to that art versus what you were doing before? Because this, pro this project, again, is such a personal project for you. Um, was there a big difference in how people received it? So uh, th there was actually a gap in social media anyway, because like those two years that I was working service industry jobs for like 60 hours a week, I had no time to create art. So I actually kind of disappeared off social media for a little while. Um, so it was, I I'm sure maybe some of those people that were collecting my work kind of moved on or whatever, but the people who, there are still people from those days that still like follow me now. And I'm always amazed by them because I feel like my arts turned into so many different things over the years. And those people who are still around are actually interested in me and my vision, which is really exciting. But of course, you know, there's also people who are just like, hey, I just like this stuff. Like, I just like this album of yours, right? I don't like this new direction you're going in. And they go off and support other artists and that's just part of it. But for me, what's always been important is like, I wanna be able to do the art that I want to make, not, not be like at the mercy of a market that I have to please. Cause there's Ooh. definitely been artists that have tried to change their style in the gallery world and it didn't sell. And then they kind of freaked out and went back to the original thing, kept doing that thing. And now they're kind of stuck there because they feel beholden to that sort of that one thing that they're known for. And I just decided, you know what, whatever the risks are, I really don't care. I want to make the work that I want to make. Um, but yeah, I feel like um, the, the response has been like overwhelmingly positive. And I was really, I think the conventions actually that I started going to in 2017 was sort of like my first, you know, like testing the waters to see like, here's this thing I've been working on, you know, very, very slowly for four years. I hope people like this or what's the response gonna be to it. And yeah, it was just like, I mean, it was just amazing to see like responses in person from people like of all backgrounds and to see like the excitement for what I was making was, was really, really amazing. And just like had people I'd cry and hug and thank me for, you know, doing it and stuff and like, and again, it's just like, it's just such a gratifying feeling for something that you're really passionate about and you have like, you put your heart and soul into. Um, but yeah, same with the Patreon. Like I started the Patreon, I think in 2018 in the summer mm -hmm. and like it's slowly grown to like, I have like 69 patrons right now and it blows my mind. Like it's nice. not huge, but I'm just like 69 people want me to make this thing and are paying me to make this thing. Like, I don't care if those are the only people on earth that want to see this made, like I'm going to make this for them, you know? And that, that feeling is just like, like, this is what I do art for, you know, to make art in this tiny room, <laughs> tiny room by myself and just like these complete strangers that I don't even know, like connected to this thing that I made. And um, yeah, it's, it's just an amazing, amazing feeling for sure. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, that's really exciting. I'm glad. I'm really glad that people are responding to it positively because I still remember uh, first seeing your table at Gen Con um, 2019 and just being blown away that I got to see these beautiful African women like depicted in such a way in a fantasy setting and you know a familiar story that has never been really told from that perspective before at least from what I had seen and it felt very validating just for you know just like our beauty and like seeing that kind of honored in such a way so you know just thank you for making um such an amazing series and you know I think that authenticity again is is coming across loud and clear. So fantastic job, Mia. I can't wait to see that when this is done. Like seriously, like you've been working really hard on this. So um, 
Yeah. I, I oh, do I mean, let it be big. <laughs> let it be big. Oh, you're very sweet. I, I do want to say something though, because I feel like it, it bears being said, and I know it's it's not something a lot of people like to hear, but um, but I feel like white presenting and white people painting people of color, like they, you have an easier time at it, I think, or in terms of the reception. And, and I think that's something you have to recognize as somebody who's doing that and understand your privilege in that regard, because especially in the last, uh, this last year uh, for uh, this year in o October, there was a, a bunch of black artists that put together a, a challenge called Blacktober where they just wanted to, you know, like paint them like basically paint themselves into these popular characters and stuff and there was a lot of joy and a lot of amazing art being made but also a lot of hate being thrown at them which I have never gotten that hate to my face like I don't know if people are doing this but it's like the fact that people would dare to do that to artists for representing themselves yeah. is honestly ridiculous and it is something that as a white or non-black artist I should say uh to do uh to to represent other people's like it's, it's the type of thing that it's like, I feel like you have to like admit, not admit, but I guess what I'm trying to say is like, you have to understand the privilege that you have and be responsible with that, you know, and, and to not be entitled with it either and pave the way for other artists if you can, or at least use your voice to tell people that's not okay. Um, when, while I was doing this, it was definitely about representing the, like people I wanted to see more in fantasy, but at the same time, it wasn't about me. And as I was thinking about it, I was thinking, you know what, my art actually isn't important. I wanna see art being made by black artists or by POC more and why aren't I seeing it? Which is why I started the interview series in 2018. I wanted to talk to, to artists of color about representation, about their work, about their careers. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it was actually kind of a precursor to this in the sense that this is kind of what I wanted to get to, to have these conversations kind of live and in person. But at the time with like two jobs, uh, and, and just me, I was just like, I'll do these written interviews. And I was really grateful for every one of those artists that agreed to be interviewed. I didn't have a huge following or a big reach, so I don't know how many people read them, but it meant a lot to me to have those conversations, at least through email, because I, I do think that representation is really important, but the more important battle is getting people to tell their own stories uh, from this underrepresented backgrounds. And I think it is a bit disingenuous for people to just to, to not acknowledge the differences in the way that artists are treated for either representing themselves or uh, people from other cultures. So anyway, I just wanted yeah, to- Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate you saying that too, because um, one of the biggest things that I always say when people ask, you know, like, oh, like I'm not from this background. Is it okay for me to like, to be, to be depicting somebody from a different culture or to make stories of people from a different culture? And I say, yes, as long as you do your due diligence, as long as you do your research, as long as you respect where that is coming from. But also if you're going to, you know, I mean, for lack of a better word, profit off of our faces, at least do your effort and do your due diligence to support us as well. And to stand by, you know, um, you know, Black Lives Matter, for example, and stand by supporting, you know, by POC artists like you're doing and to uplift those voices and to put those artists in the forefront as well. Because if you don't do that, then you're just kind of taking that profit and just running away with it without really putting the respect behind it without really putting the effort behind understanding what where that culture is coming from and what those those cultures have to go through. So the fact that, you know, you had depicted this, you know, the story itself is is what I mean by, you know, authentic. And then our the depiction how you do it is just so beautiful. Um, and then also the fact that you put your effort in supporting black artists and supporting artists of color and um, just trying to get those voices to the forefront you're doing the due diligence. And so, you know, that is appreciated, but I have seen a lot of artists who don't do that. And so if people, you know, if anybody's watching this and, and you're thinking about doing a project like this, or at least thinking about, you know, glorifying the beauty of different cultures and different, you know, um, peoples of color, at least try to support those people, try to donate, try to raise awareness, try to do what you can to stand by that community if you're going to depict that community. So that's, that's my piece about it. Yeah, that's awesome. I think we can take us out now. Um, Mia, is there anything that you want to promote or anything that you want to, um, you know, plug before we leave today? Um, I, I don't have anything going on, but I mean, I guess uh, I do have a Patreon. I did mention it's patreon.com forward slash Mia Araujo, and you'll see my name spelled on the screen there. Um, but that's, you know, that's the best way to follow the process of the, of the story. Um, I try to p share story updates um, and art, like in progress art, they basically get to see everything before everybody else sees it. And um, uh, yeah, that's kind of the only thing I can think of. 
<laughs> and then definitely keep watching this show. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right, thank you so much. This has oh. been awesome. Um, so thank you everybody for watching. I uh, appreciate y'all being here and we'll catch you until next time. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>